welcome to the Massachusetts Historical Society. I'm Catherine Algor and I'm the president here at the Society and really looking forward to tonight's program. Uh, let's face it, any title with the words John Winthrop in it, it's really us. Um, I'm hoping that I'm speaking to lots of people who've become regulars uh, here at our public programs. And I hope you're getting a sense of sort of who we are and the breadth of what we do. But did you know that the Massachusetts Historical Society is the state sponsor for History Day? What is History Day, you ask? Well, it's a national competition that's held at the state level. Um, it's sort of like science fair meets spelling bee meets the early seasons of Glee. So uh, all, all of this past fall, about 6,000 students in Massachusetts have been working with primary sources, learning how to research, develop critical thinking skills, and mounting projects. And starting in a couple of weeks, the competition begins. So they compete at the local level, at the state, and finally there's the national competition in June. And we don't have enough time for me to tell you how wonderful History Day is in all ways, but what I will tell you is that Massachusetts shamefully has one of the lowest participation rates because we don't get any money from the state. So we at the Historical Society raise money so that um, our students have the equipment to uh, do their projects and they can travel to compete. So if any of this touches your heart, go onto the website and look at the History Day website. I think you'll be um, happy and excited. I always say working with History Day as a judge or a participant or as an observer gives you hope for the future. And on that happy note, I'm gonna let my colleague uh, introduce the program, Gavin. Thank you, Catherine. And thank you all for joining us this evening. Uh, my name is Gavin Cleesbees and I'm the Director of Programs, Exhibitions and Community Partnerships for the Massachusetts Historical Society. Uh, before we begin, I'd like to let all of you know a little bit about MHS in case anyone uh, isn't familiar with the organization. We are the first historical society of America and we have been collecting, preserving, publishing, and sharing our nation's history since 1791. We hold an amazing collection of manuscripts that is measured in the millions with the papers of US presidents, mothers, scientists, pioneers, and of course, portions of John Winthrop's journal as we featured in our opening slide. Prior to the pandemic, when we hosted uh, programs in person, we would often assemble a display case that featured items from our collection that was relevant to the evening's talk. Uh, our opening slide tonight is our attempt to adapt that tradition to Zoom. Um, we make all of our collections available. Uh, we make them available to researchers and we host an active schedule of programs for the general public, for educators and for academic audiences. We do all of this uh, online during the pandemic for free, uh, but we're only able to do this thanks to the support of our members. If you're not a supporter of MHS, I hope you'll consider joining us to support our work. We have a great program tonight that will look at John Winthrop and the Massachusetts Bay Colony in a new light. Our speaker tonight, Agnes Delay, has spent years, arguably decades, uh, studying the Massachusetts Bay Colony uh, and will offer a look at John Winthrop's life as not just a religious leader, but as a settler and a leader of a developing colony. She also explores how Winthrop's archives and history and the histories he wrote uh, were influenced by his experience as a settler and how those writings have influenced the sense of American exceptionalism and generations of American histories. Professor Delay holds a PhD from the Sorbonne in Paris. She is a professor of American studies at the University of Lyon. Uh, she has published articles in French and in English uh, on New England historiography, on John Winthrop, uh, on MHS's founder, Jeremy Belknap, and on settler colonialism as a historical concept. We can't begin the program without mentioning the fact that this is also our first transatlantic program. Uh, and we're very grateful uh, to Professor DeLay uh, for staying up late and joining us uh, from a very different time zone on the other side of the Atlantic. So without further ado, uh, I will ask her to join us and, and kick off our program. Thank you, Gavin. Thank you very much. And thank you, Catherine. Um, thank you for your introduction. I want to thank everyone on the public program for making it possible for me to be here with you tonight. It's an incredible honor to be able to present this book to an MHS audience. I've been using the Society's collection since I began working on New England a long time ago, but not that long. And I had the pleasure, um, and I feel quite at home here, having published um, articles on the founding of this venerable institution. And as you said, Gavin, on its founder, Jeremy Belknap, who fully um, understood the, um, the value 
of the Winthrop Archive. So this is the cover of, of the book, um, Settling the Good Land, Governance and Promotion in John Winthrop's New England. Uh, why am I sorry about this, but oh yeah, I get you. There we go. <laughs> um, I am here uh, to present a book that is part, part of a wider historiographic project about the formation of New England's historical tradition. Tonight, I would like to explain to you briefly the genealogy of this project, then talk a little bit about the questions I asked and the method that I devised to answer them, before sharing with you some of my findings about the settlement project that Winthrop wrote about so extensively. I will explain how I trace the idea of settlement as a particular mode of colonial occupation in early modern English promotion in the first decades before the founding of the Emmett, uh, Massachusetts Bay Company, then how Winthrop made his decision for America, a story of kinship and political ambition, as well as religion, and what colonial governments in a settlement entailed. I'll conclude on the nature of his legacy. I am hoping to make you see this well-known figure in a new light, less as a Puritan figure and more as a colonial governor and promoter who had a considerable sense of both time and place. So first, why did I come to spend so much of my research time exploring the world of John Winthrop? Historians don't always like to acknowledge it, but my but research is often triggered by personal circumstances or, or reasons. Having grown up uh, not too far from the beaches of D-Day, undoubtedly played a part in directing me towards American history at the onset of my studies. In the late 1990s, when I started, French historians and Americanists more generally, were quite happy with understanding early New England through its religious text exclusively and framing all their interpretations within the Puritan paradigm. Exceptionalism was the order of the day and the mission to found the city upon a hill from Winthrop's model of Christian charity, his most cited text, was so powerful that it structured even the social history of the region typically the formation of each individual New England town around one minister or one congregation where all life and events were concentrated. I was naturally drawn to this narrative of Protestant resistance because of my own family's culture. French Protestants uh, often think of themselves as forced to resist the nation's Catholic traditions, résister um, and not register, <laughs> résister on this uh, slide, uh, an engraving supposedly carved by Marie Durand during her imprisonment in the Tower of Constance in the 1730s. So I first spent a year in Holland writing a master's thesis on the historiography of the pilgrim removal and decided upon a possible PhD on the early history of Protestant congregations in the New World. In 1999, I decided to have a look at the journal of John Winthrop, whom I'd read cited multiple times. My expectations of the book in its wonderful Harvard 1996 edition, whose title page is here on your screen, were of a, dep were of a depiction of religious exile and religious trials in a language steeped in biblical precedents. I was sitting at the British Library in rare books at the British Library, some of you may know, when I started reading uh, the journal from the first page and I was immediately blown away by the force of the book and transported into a world I had not known and could not yet fully understand. In spite of the loss of the manuscript of the largest middle section in a fire, which only survives in its early 19th century transcription, all sections present remarkable cohesion in terms of style, content, and tone. I was also struck by how focused Winthrop's narrative was on his company's project and its success. The journal covers many issues and has many characters, but the overall intent remains constantly the same to argue for the legitimacy of settler occupation and the sovereignty of the corporation over the land and its many peoples. Also incredibly striking I found was Winthrop's voice, a voice of advocacy seeking to persuade and neutralize criticism, 
What criticism? I didn't uh, understand that at the time. Richard Dunn, the editor of this of the Harvard edition, has this wonderful phrase: "Winthrop is the man you love to hate, because he can be self-righteous, obnoxious, and obtuse, often twisting situations uh, to make the corporation look good, all in service of his commission to serve and protect the corporation and its sovereignty." What I found even more powerful and quite puzzling was his sense of history. He conveyed a strong awareness of being part of a new development in English expansion, a form of overseas occupation on an Atlantic scale that had no real precedent and therefore needed to be recorded and accounted for. The journal narrates months after months the confrontation of the corporation and its members to the New England landscape and environment the cruelty of the ocean and the seasons, the flora and fauna affecting the settler's ability to cultivate and survive, the pests, the storms, death and disease in winter, in summer, in spring. It describes also a fierce and unforgiving world of commercial and territorial competition, war, enslavement, and considerable violence, a far cry from the inward looking world of Puritan congregations I had been trained to expect. This was not a Puritan journal, but something else. And it has taken me this long and many forays in different disciplines to finally understand colonial enterprise, financing and labor regimes, early modern corporate structures and functionings, modes of indigenous dispossession and resistance, and the many strategies put in place by the company on the ground and in the texts to legitimize its presence and its governance for all stakeholders to accept. I have read the journal as one of the first settler history, histories of the Anglo world. And it is, I believe, as a settler governor and historian that Winthrop still matters. Winthrop, as you know, all know, I am sure, is initially an important figure of sectional memory. He was consecrated very early on in New England history as the father of the country by Cotton Mather in his Magnalia. The bronze cast of Richard Greenall's 1876 marble statue of him uh, was first set in the vicinity of Boston City Hall and moved to the front of the first church in 1904, bringing him closer uh, to the community of Boston worshipers. Not only was he the founder of a long line of Boston Brahmins, Winthrop also embodies righteous governance and the virtues of the ideal New England ruler, which I believe earned him his marble position in the Hall of Columns in the Capitol. Same statue, different material. Books are regularly published about his contribution to American exceptionalist discourse, the latest one being Abraham Van Engen's City on a Hill, published last year at Yale which traces the history of the manuscript of Winthrop's model, but says nothing about the journal or Winthrop's functions at the head of the founding corporation. Winthrop matters because of the sheer size and wealth of his archive, preserved and passed on from generation to generation of New England politicians, historians, and academics who saw value in keeping these documents as precedents of previous policy and political heritage. No early agent of English colonization has left such a sizable testimony of how, how settlements were organized and expanded, how indigenous neighbors were dispossessed, and how colonial trade developed in these early days. No other colonial official, official sorry, either factor, envoy, representative, or governor has left a record of policy in so many different forms, official documents, public and private letters, records of court decisions and a coherent narrative. Lastly, Winthrop matters for his awareness of the novelty of the mode of colonial enterprise he and his peers were engaged in. John Smith wanted to be seen as the theorist of successful English expansion in North America. William Bradford in his of Plymouth Plantation tried to settle matters with sponsoring merchants and colonial rivals but Winthrop was, as far as I know, the only early modern colonial leader who wrote in situ, aware of what was at stake in the particular mode of colonization his com company had chosen to pursue. 
So what kind of history book has she written then, you might be asking yourselves. Well, some fellow historians will reject it outright because it is not based on the uncovering of unknown material. In fact, the only reason I could work from Europe on this material is that it had been published in the collections of the MHS, and for that I'm really grateful. The sources are indeed well known. The journal has been transcribed and edited whole or in parts regularly since the early national period. We also owe the MHS the publication of the five volumes of the records of the governor and company in Massachusetts Bay, the corporation's official record um, in the mid 19th century, as well as the volumes of the Winthrop papers also recently dig uh, partly digitized by the society. But the questions brought to these sources have changed greatly and they can be reopened from perspectives nourished by these new viewpoints. For instance, the development of lived and popular religion, Puritanism from the bottom up, so to speak, tends to direct scholars away from the archive of prominent figures, the great white men of history, whose dominance and relevance is rightly challenged by social history, gender history, and cultural history. Winthrop, in this context, is closer to the fiery and bigoted magistrates of Hawthorne's witch trials than to colonial leaders, which the historiography um, um, like Roger Williams or William Penn uh, associated in the historiography with greater modernity and therefore more liberty. There is no longer one Puritanism, but many trends and variants that lessen the impact of the Puritan mission in New England. Winthrop, as the perpetually challenged leader of the Puritan orthodoxy, tends to be used as the epitome of what was old world, conservative, and pre-modern about the region founding, set against a desire for modernity and change from the younger men, women, and dissenters. But more importantly, perspectives on American colonization have also greatly expanded beyond the confines of regional or American history to reach Atlantic and even global scope. As we learn to compare between spaces of European colonial appropriation, New England becomes less exceptional and religion less explanatory than the economic, commercial, and political incentives behind overseas migration, expansion, and trade. So how can we apprehend Winthrop's opus in this context? What do the Winthrop papers, the NBC records, and the journal teach us about the thinking and the decision-making of the men who first attempted to recreate English living overseas. To answer these questions, I decided not to look forward to what contribution Winthrop had made to American historical or religious traditions, not to start my inquiry on board the Arbella, where Winthrop delivered his model of Christian charity. I decided to look back if you restrict your thinking to the Puritan mission to build the city upon a hill, you do not need context or precedence. Biblical precedents suffice, especially when New England ministers use them so extensively. But when you consider first that colonization was the sum of a variety of business ventures, and second, that it was public and publicized in the early 17th century to raise investment, to solicit pay, sorry, patronage and protection, then you must look for sources where knowledge and assumptions about good and bad practice and governance were shared across borders, languages, and uh, religious differences. I therefore ask new questions more fitted to this wider economic context. How much does this 41-year-old lawyer know about America before he left uh, England? How much did he understand about colonial enterprise? Were there precedents for the MDC, MBC project of permanent settlement? And if so, why had they failed? I kept religion always in my radar because Winthrop was devout and understood his career in religious terms, his precious calling on which he built the assurance of his salvation but I learned to distinguish what belonged to his religious practice and his faith and what belonged to the assumptions shared across the board by European colonizers about the role of religion in facilitating and justifying conquest. Concretely, 
I read the three sources of early New England mentioned above um, for earlier, the journal, the records, and the Winthrop papers, very closely together, it, slowly in chronological order, while trying to contextualize each issue, discussion, or novelty in a wider context. Early modern English society and culture on the one end, and colonization and empire on the other. I looked at what mattered for Winthrop ever since he started writing. And he started around age 17 and wrote regularly, regularly throughout his life. To build a profile of the colonial governor he was to become, to find out how knowledge about Amer America accumulated in English colonial circles close to him. And once the great migration had begun, how settlement grew and functioned as a result not of organic phenomena like the growth of the population, but of deliberate decision making on the part of the colonial government with Rob uh, led. I chose this cameo, which is much later, it, it doesn't, it's not from the 1630s, um, to illustrate the cover because I wanted to convey how intimate had become with this man's culture, his thinking, and his desires. To provide context, I read every promotional piece of writing in English that I could find at the British Library and elsewhere to uncover the birth of the idea of permanent English settlement in the New World. I realized quickly that promotional literature or the writings about overseas explorations and enterprise were a fully fledged genre with recurrent tropes and formulae like the fruits of one, one's labor to define overseas economic gains or loving your chimney corner too much, an accusation leveled at those who criticize colonization. These texts and images circulated across Europe because they were partly the place where knowledge about landscapes, peoples, and business practice accumulated. Repetition was key to making facts and representations intelligible to European audiences while merchants and companies competed over sea and land. I could see that by the Elizabethan period, the opposition between civilization and savagery had been normalized as an evangelical argument for expansion, as on the seal of the NBC on the slide here, on which a willing native man calls upon the English to come and save his people, but also as a legitimation for the appropriation of indigenous land and goods for the economic advantage of Europeans. The good land that I used for my title encompasses all these dimensions. It is a biblical phrase initially, as you know, referring to God's promise to his people that they should toil but prosper and multiply in Canaan, found in all religious promotion of the early modern period. It was particularly prevalent in English promotion because the English had been left out of the race for overseas possessions for over a century, had been relegated, consequently relegated to regions where there was no gold and where only full on agricultural labor and extraction would generate em enough commodities, in this case, timber, fish and grain to enrich its sponsors. In the long run, fur brought money but had much greater geopolitical implications and therefore was more risky. In Winthrop's writing in particular, as in the model, for instance, the good land defines spaces of English permanent occupation and ownership, where individual free men worked their own properties once indigenous people had been removed, willingly or forcefully, and Winthrop definitely adhered to both methods. It signified colonial success, space appropriated and transformed to generate for its owners both political autonomy and economic com competency, the ability to live free of debt and free of a landlord. <clears throat> I worked my way through all the publications surrounding colonial ventures in the, in the decades preceding Winthrop's departure to trace the emergence of settlement as a particular mode of colonial occupation. I found the idea of the presence of a permanent labor force uh, on the Eastern seaboard in the writings of colonial agents close to the Queen's favorite privateers, uh, Walter Raleigh and Humphrey Gilbert, 
who sought to improve returns on shipping ventures that too often ended up in failure and financial and human losses. So there's business success, but uh, in the early 17th century, mostly um, business failure. And that's an important factor to remember. As those failures multiplied, Roanoke's uh, on the outer banks of uh, North Carolina, Sagadahoc in Nova Scotia, and Jamestown continued to bring nothing but news of, of death and violence, Stuart promoters began uh, to argue that the first winter in the north or the seasoning in warmer regions could only be surmounted with a sufficient on-site labor force, suitably managed and suitably rewarded to prevent desertion, insurrection, and death. The writings of John Smith are particularly crucial in this context because he argued repeatedly that good colonial management only came to those who'd experienced settlement firsthand, as opposed to financial interests in the metropole who were greedy and blind to the specifics of the enterprise, especially when it came to managing uh, the workforce, the crucial element in successful colonizing ventures. Now, the first stable settlement, the first settlement that managed to survive the first winter and to stab stabilize its presence on the seaboard was Plymouth, um, uh, to which I devote chapter two of uh, Settling the Good Land, for the importance of Edward Winslow's writings in shaping the expectations of the investors of the Massachusetts Bay Company and the names come back um, uh, between the two, the Plymouth uh, Association of Merchants and the MBC share a, a lot of members, a few members. So um, what expectations? Self-regulation, communal defense, and individual ownership, and the necessity to set clear and firm boundaries between settler, settlers and indigenous neighbors on the one hand, and between permanent settlers and interlopers or transient elements whose self-interest jeopardized the solidity and the safety of the community. Because settlement was a commercial enterprise, I studied the formation of the MBC from an economic and institutional perspective, comparing it to previous New England, England ventures in fish, fur, and cattle that would prove decisive in its future. I studied the interconnections between its investors who resembled other colonial networks of the period. That is, they held um, a very diversified colonial portfolio to minimize risks. And I identified the moment in the summer of 1629 when its magistrates, and we would say today its board of directors, decided that the enterprise was worth pursuing, but only if sufficient labor and uh, suitable management uh, were sent over there, which required technically the removal of the company and its charter from England to New England. They used land as capital for the first time, recruiting house householders and their dependents by promising them permanent ownership of their piece of corporate holdings in return for their commitment to migrate and to improve, to stay on the land and improve it within three years of their arrival. That is to turn it into plowed and tilled land and build a house on it. Magistrates immediately seize large and strategic place, strategically placed holdings for themselves upon arrival, arguing for the necessity to occupy key positions across the map to prevent other colonial rivals from creeping in, the French to the north and the Dutch to the south. They had a clear plan for this first settlement across the bay as at the mouths of its many rivers, where they aim to practice mixed agriculture, corn and cattle, and fishing, and capture as much of the fur trade as they could. Winthrop himself pays considerable attention in his journal to trading opportunities, not only with partners in England who were um, part of the support network necessary for the commercial dimension of the company to function, but with all areas of the Atlantic world, hence the importance of captains and merchants in the network he developed as soon as his tenure began. The map here comes from uh, Woods New England Prospects of 1634, and it shows how the bay was chosen for the safety it provided from the sea and its privateers and the importance of rivers in settlement plans. 
It shows settlement was dispersed and strategic, interconnecting areas constantly expanding inland and very different from the white steeple and closed community structure of New England's imagined community. The NBC investors also used promotion extensive, extensively, published and manuscript tests, texts that were, uh, as far as I can see, often written collectively that have been used by historiography, but rarely in the context of this particular inno innovative venture. Part of my argument is therefore that before you approach an early New England text, you need to understand what purpose it served and read it in that context. The central chapter of the book is the very long chapter four, which considers Winthrop's decision for America in this wide colonial and institutional context. To simplify a bit here, you could say I have identified a series of push and pull factors that centered uh, on the limits placed upon him by English society. He repeatedly expressed frustration with the limited access to land he enjoyed as a lower man lord and the social barriers to his ascent within his profession as a land lawyer. On the eve of his departure, he was writing to his friends at the top of East Anglian society that there was no political future for middlemen like him in a country where power was increasingly centralized in the hands of a hostile monarchy and its minions. Privately, and more importantly for him, because he was a family man with much love for his uh, wives and children, he also needed money to finance his children's future and he struggled to reach that level of financial comfort. The history of his family is actually um, a one between town and country. For like his father and his uncles, he shared his time between his Suffolk Manor, where he farmed, uh, that had only been in the family for two generations, and his London chambers at the Inns of Court uh, with other gentry lawyers, like him, penalized by English land law and decorum, and forced to practice some form of trade or law to keep up with their status. His kinship network also ex actually extended well beyond England through other colonial ventures, principally in Ireland, colonized in part by the English since the middle of the previous uh, century, and which had been part of his family's evolution since his uncle had tried his luck there when Winthrop was just a boy. I believe that his decision was really made after his second son Henry came back in June 1629 from Barbados with nothing but debt, having fallen prey to the prospects of tobacco growing and slave ownership on the fragile island. Once in London, Henry corrupted his cousin and thereby jeopardized his father's precious standing and reputation at a time when he was out of a legal commission and conflicts between king and parliament were making things very difficult for a hired man like him. Pool factors, on the other hand, were the promises contained in the um, company project. The availability of land for full and permanent ownership to which Winthrop associated both competency and manhood as other men of his time did. The prospects of colonization, allowing free men to leave their children the fruit of their labor, as opposed to feudal English land law, which had made it so hard for him to hold on to his English land, and the opportunity to exercise power and his legal expertise outside the constraints of English social hierarchy. Lastly, I believe he was motivated by the opportunity to write for posterity, to go down in history, as it were, by recording the empowered experience of English settlers, those who had left England never to return and whose daring and sacrifice would not be forgotten. Winthrop was a colonial governor when there were very few of those around. He was elected in London in October 29 to transfer the Massachusetts Bay Company executive and charter from England to New England, where he could exert a better control over its capital and its labor force. 
He remained at the Court of Magistrates, the colonial executive, until his death in 1649, fulfilling his precious commission that gave meaning to his existence and to his status. As such, he exercised multiple functions at regional level, as opposed to town level, uh, more familiar to us because of the structure of historiography. These functions were a mix of management and political responsibilities. They included distributing the land to corporate members according to the company's charter and statutes, designing and enforcing company law amidst many conflicts with peers, dissidents, and enemies of the corporation, representing the colonial government abroad in writing, mostly, and defending the company's interests and sovereignty, in part by rejecting and condemning English aristocratic mores and privileges he had been so frustrated with in his youth. And I think some of his most uh, biting passages are uh, those uh, directed at the few English noblemen who find their way, usually young men like Henry Vane, who find their way to uh, New England as a step up in their um, training. They, uh, these functions also include in practicing terror throughout indigenous territories within the wider borders of the charter's title and institution institutionalizing forms of violence of a colonialist nature, like the militia, but also the writing out of indigenous agency from his record, or the use of euphemisms to describe enslavement and fierce labor and social control across the settled territory. His legacy is therefore much wider than uh, Puritan leadership. He left a colossal and underused archive that can still inform us on how colonial policy was conceived and evolved into political norms and traditions. His policies and his arguments constitutes precedents of settler governance and settler historical writing that need to be compared to other places and other periods of British occupation overseas. I believe he infused this work with what I have called commonality of purpose, for lack of a more elegant phrase, to define the consensus that reigned among corporate members about why they had come to New England and what they were trying to achieve collectively and individually, including uh, Indian, uh, indigenous uh, dispossession and colonial violence. Throughout his archive, we can witness the emergence of settler rights and settler liberties born in the very actions of land appropriation and settlement that embody the complexities of colonization. On the one hand, increasingly racialized views of ownership, power, and entitlements, and on the other, the empowered experience of political liberty for corporate members or 300 years of independent civil government as advertised on this colorful com commemorative postcard of the tricentenary of the founding. I'm hoping to take these questions about settler governance and settler history into the next decade, uh, when stakeholders changed and the scope of exchange and expansion was much wider, and the political climate also profoundly uh, changed by the onset of the Civil War in Britain. Uh, Winthrop died uh, just a few weeks weeks after the execution of Charles I, but I don't believe he would have ever gone back to England. There is still uh, much to think about regarding the evolution of sell set settlement in these early days, but for now, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. And thank you very much for a, a great presentation. I think you've given us lots of things to think about. Um, I would just remind the audience that um, if they would like to ask a question, uh, we ask them to use the Q&A function and to type it uh, in at the bottom of the screen, and we'll get to as many questions as we can. Um, I can see that we already have a, a decent number of questions lined up. So um, we can start with one from Mimi, who said, uh, so from a wealthy landowning and merchant family, how much did Winthrop know about the reality of America before departing for, from England? How did his education and sense of history prepare him uh, to encounter the indigenous people? Okay, so I guess there are two questions. Um, he wasn't that wealthy. 
uh, it is true that the um, historiography, especially around the middle of the 19th century, um, thought of the Winthrop family because they had arms, for instance, as a particularly wealthy family, but they weren't. Actually, well, they were, of course, uh, because they were members of the gentry and they didn't starve. But Winthrop looked, um, was always short of money. Um, he um, owned the, uh, he, the manor got to him after 15 years of legal um, conflict um, within his kinship network because of his uncle's previous marriage. And these have to do with the rules of coverture, which are very complex in those days. So he, of course, uh, he comes from uh, middle, the middle section of uh, English society, but he's not rich in the sense that for him, colonization will definitely be an economic opportunity and uh, not just a religious one. He, uh, he aims for competency and competency is the ability to live and pass on to your children land that they will own fully. And he couldn't in 1629, when he decides for colonization, he doesn't have these resources. He has seven children, uh, six sons, they're unprovided for and they have no calling. And the uh, perspective of uh, ownership of that much land, even if it's far away, um, uh, certainly appealed to him. Your second question was how much did he know? Well, when he starts, uh, so he, he is hired by the company in October 29 and between October 29 and the spring of 1630, he, he trains in promotional literature, uh, promotional writing. And he uses the tropes that other promoters before him have used. I personally don't believe that he has that much curiosity or, or wonder about the land and the people. In the journal, there are very, I mean, his, his descriptions of the land are very down to earth and usually very um, utilitarian. Um, there was this landscape, there was this river, this pond and this beaver dam and um, this land looks good and this wood is particularly generous. These things, he is really a governor, that's my argument. You really understand how he writes from the perspective of the function that he exercises. So I think he's read Winslow, definitely. Therefore, I've only used uh, promotion that I sent or I knew he had access to through his network of merchant friends and investors. And, um, and I found in his writing tropes that were common about um, uh, the necessity to convert indigenous people and also the fact that uh, they had no sense of value. And therefore, if you went over there and gave them trifles, trifles is definitely the most recurrent word of promotional literature. And it signifies economic advantage on the part of Europeans. So there's this idea that Native Americans do not understand the value of things and therefore they can be bought very easily. I hope I've answered these two questions. <laughs> Thank you. So uh, Peter wrote, uh, could you provide some examples of how a corporate fundraising changed the narrative Winthrop authored? Uh, how would it have sounded differently if he had been truthful and objective? I'm sorry if you understood that he wasn't truthful and objective. He was very objective within the function that he um, uh, operated. He, his, his commission as governor required the recruitment of uh, householders to whom the company offered a, a certain um, portion of land to till and own for the future. So this was, this is the, what is unprecedented in what the company was doing. It used land as capital. Initially, the land being empty had no value. But within 10, 15 years, you can see through his correspondence that is that there is an active land market in early New England very quickly. When they want to rebuild the Boston Meeting House, I think he says they sold the building, the old building for 300 pounds. So there is definitely money 
circulating, land is exchanged and passed on very early on. And that was their gamble. You recruit the right people by promising them full inalienable ownership. And that's also in the, in the legal code of New England, doing away with all the feudal remnants of land law that in England never made you a full owner of your land. You always, it always returned to the crown somewhere or another uh, within the history of your family. And he uh, was very much aware of that. Uh, let me remind you that he worked for a few months uh, at the court of wards and liveries before it was abolished. And he worked on behalf of, of clients who uh, for reasons of disease, death, had lost their land momentarily. And he worked on their behalf to uh, get it back uh, when the crown had confis confiscate, confiscated it. <laughs> and um, so he, he was very honest in the way that he wrote about the purpose of the, uh, of the company, its economic aim that was shared. It wasn't, the idea wasn't that you would have um, uh, investors at one end making all the money and people working as in the head right system where people were promised a, a, a bit of land but there was no involvement in how to make this land valuable or profitable. The NBC did, went the other way around. It had a clear plan for increasing the value of that land very quickly through organized labor. So it's uh, different from Jamestown in that there's a different sense of uh, ownership stake in, in the people going over and uh, the permanency of that. I mean, do you want to talk at all about the comparison between Jamestown and Massachusetts Bay or? Dude, you want me? To, well, when what Winthrop reads in the 1620s about Virginia are reports of insurrection and desertion and Indian attacks and general precariousness that is attributed by throughout the campaign because the Virginia Company campaign, a promotional campaign of 1616, 1620 is enormous. Uh, there are huge quantities of sermons and pamphlets and letters promoting Jamestown and really trying to get the English people to invest or donate a little bit towards uh, making that uh, plantation successful. But what he hears is, is stories of brutal social hierarchy, inept government, changes at the helm, um, uh, precariousness really due to uh, management, uh, lack of management more like. And that's already something that John Smith was saying and that he keeps writing as he reads about Massachusetts plans and, uh, and writes uh, in his own uh, writing, well, they got it right. They know, you know, how they're going to make themselves. They're going to give themselves the means to succeed. So Winthrop has really um, integrated and understood that for a colonial venture to succeed, everything lies in the quality of the management, and that's what makes the job of governor appealing to him. I believe. I forgot to unmute myself. Uh, <laughs> we have uh, a lot of really good questions, which um, if we don't get to all of them, we uh, will certainly pass them on to you so that you can see them uh, in the future. Um, uh, Marlene wrote, uh, who are Winthrop's rivals, if any, in the election to lead the transition of the company to New England? Um, there are no rivals because you don't think of Massachusetts as Virginia. It's a very small company. Its capital is about 5,000 pounds. And like every company, it is the offshoot of a few previous merchant associations that have failed. So with every failure, there's learning. And if you wanna learn how they did it, you read the planter's plea. John White's planter's plea explains very clearly how, um, 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 how they uh, realized that in order to make fishing profitable, they had to make the fish fishing season much longer. It was simply too short. And it would also really be helpful if they could have salt already there when they arrived. So that's the beginning of the Massachusetts Bay Company. Uh, um, 
it's the Dorchester company and then it's the New England company and finally it's the Massachusetts Bay company. It has a uh, a few investors there, uh, the main ones are about 15 to 20. Um, all of them will, not all of them, but half of them will keep a stake in the NBC after the beginning of the uh, Great Migration. Um, but um, w uh, Winthrop is the main volunteer for settlement, as it were. And the awareness of, of uh, Matthew Craddock, who is the main investor behind the company, is that Winthrop will do a good job. And therefore, he's, he's elected very um, naturally and spontaneously to this job. I don't think it's a small company, very few men. Most of them then are investors with many investments in different portfolios. So it wouldn't have made business sense for them to give it all out to uh, uh, the NBC and go to New England. Winthrop was from a different um, um, circle because he was a lawyer and not a businessman, not a, not a, not a merchant originally. And, um, and he traveled for more personal reasons, I believe, than his peers. So um, Nick said, I would like to hear any thoughts about Winthrop's feelings about the English Civil War and how did he deal with the return of many colonists back to England during this time? So that's, he, 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 he considers desertion as betrayal. He has a very emotional um, attachment to the land and to the company and to the innovation uh, that this political corporation represented in the Anglo world. And he believes that deserters are cowards, that nothing will change. He makes no comment. He's definitely on the side of the roundheads, but he's, he's, um, he's, not, he's not a regicide. He doesn't uh, go out. He's quite conservative politically <laughs> and, and mostly he's concerned with his own corporation. So he writes, uh, that uh, they left and when they got to England they realized that nobody was there for them and they lost everything anyway so he writes very bitterly for him it's desertion and it's a form of betrayal and he writes it very clearly in a speech on little liberty I think where he writes um, imagine and I'm paraphrasing of course he says uh, imagine if you had sacrificed so much risked so much of your life, your assets, your family, and you found yourself in the middle of the wilderness and then everybody ran out and left you all alone. How would you feel? So commonality of purpose is really what I, I try to pinpoint this, this uh, solidarity that he, this cohesion that he sees within the corporation because they've gone through these experiences together and uh, and uh, he so deserters and the worst deserter is Humphrey, and he describes um, how after Humphrey left um, for the Caribbean and not for England, his daughters get um, raped and one of the rapists is the brother. So he writes the whole desertion in terms of sexual and emotional and degeneracy. For it's it's, it's utter and profound betrayal. It's, it's very hard for him to take. Except from when it, for his nephew or people like that who will go over there and, and then represent the company and support its interests. But uh, general people <laughs> who leave um, and, and don't bring anything back to the company usually are, are badly criticized. Uh, so Christopher wrote, uh, Professor, based on your presentation, would you suggest that his piece, A Model of Christian Charity, is more propaganda for him than central than a central moral philosophy? <laughs> um, propaganda. I don't I don't like that word. I prefer promotion. I mean, maybe because I'm European, but propaganda for me um, evokes very modern forms of communication. And promotional literature wasn't like that. And the English public cared very little about what was happening in the colonies uh, until way into the 18th century. So I don't like the term propaganda, but promotion, yes. Is it a work of promotion or moral philosophy? I think you have to remember that beyond the charter and the few statutes that Winthrop has in his possession, 
he doesn't know the 700 people on the boat with him and he has no clear power nowhere is it written that the governor you know will do this and do that and also he needs to be elected every year so he needs from day one to somehow mix this crowd of people, some from the east of England, some from southern England, some of, uh, are just a family, others are a whole congregation. He has to uh, make himself known as someone who is proposing to them and guaranteeing also to them that the government will not let them down, provided that they support it sufficiently. And that's the negotiation at work in the model of Christian charity. But, you know, this text has been used so much. It's really hard to read it, to peel everything you've, you've heard about it when you read it. But try, try to, try to think of, try to read it again and imagine this, these people on these ships facing 12 weeks of a crossing, going to a place that they have some knowledge about, some mental representation about, but really know very little. And, and this, this voice is here to tell them that they have a common project and that this common project will be rewarding for them individually and collectively. But you know, there are also very stark social differences between migrants. They are some very, uh, some, some people are traveling with, with workers, with laborers, sometimes up to 15 laborers who are gonna toil at land and build that house for them. And others are just husband and wife and a couple of children. How are they going to survive that first winter? Because they're not sharing their, their goods. They're not sharing what they own. They're not putting uh, their food and their, and their clothes and everything together and then sharing it when they get to New England, when they get to America. It's everybody lives on what they've bought with them. So that's my answer <laughs> to Christopher. <laughs> Thank you. So uh, Charles wrote, um, how does the antinomian uh, controversy fit into your analysis. Okay. Um, I'm sure some people wondered why I didn't talk about Anna Chinson. Uh, I, um, that's uh, chapter seven. I think that uh, religion for Winthrop is both part of the colonial project because it structures uh, the settlement, it organizes the week. Uh, it makes sure that people take a break from their labor and get together and get the social emotional support that church going provides them. But it's also a risk. What Winthrop really dislikes about the antinomian is their uh, pretension that they can change the course of history. They can, they can come over and get imprisoned or banished or even killed and earn a salvation or a reputation through these ordeals, but what they are fundamentally doing is jeopardizing the uh, basic stability of the corporation. And that is unacceptable to him. And I think that's the bottom of his criti criticism against uh, Anne Hutchinson, but also John Wheelwright and Henry Vane, and to a large extent, John Cotton, is this idea that who are you to take over public space and, and disrupt this harmony that we are struggling to keep day in, day out, when the Dutch are, uh, the French are coming and uh, you know, there's agitation on the Connecticut River and we haven't really secured our space, secured our supplies, secured our trading network. This is disruptive and really uncomfortable to him. So uh, again, I have to say that we have a huge number of questions. So uh, there's a lot that we are unfortunately not going to be able to get to, but I, I think that we probably have time for, for one last one. Um, and uh, Marlene wrote, uh, what were Winthrop's views of women's roles and rights in the settlement? Okay. Women are mothers. Women are, women are mothers. A settlement works only if you have enough people to occupy as much land as you can. And I mean, he loved his wife very much. I say wives, not because he had many at once, but because, you know, women tended to die a lot in childbirth. And uh, he was married four times uh, after having lost uh, the previous spouse. Um, Margaret, he spent the most time with and he really loved her, but he really believed that women were of weak minds and uh, were not intellectually suited for things such as politics. And uh, so he criticized husbands who, but whenever he criticized a woman, he was really criticizing the man behind her. 
Um, I would say in this journal, there's very little space for women. And when there is, they are really praised for their ability to procreate and ability to um, uh, keep uh, the home and allow for farming to go on. Sorry to disappoint you, but <laughs> I'm, I'm assuming I'm disappointing you, but no, no, no feminist, no. <laughs> I don't know if that's uh, disappointing. It may just be confirming. <laughs> well, um, I want to thank you for a really great presentation. Um, and again, we have uh, so many questions. We can't, we can't get to all of them. But. And I just wanted to say, no one could call you weak-minded. <laughs> um, but thank you. I think you've really opened our minds up about John Winthrop. It's amazing. So good luck with your book. Thank you very much. Thank you everyone for your attention. Uh, the book is available. Uh, it is available through local bookstores if you would like to do that, although it does seem that it has to be a special order. Um, but again, uh, in these times, we hope you enjoy our free programs. We also hope you'll consider supporting the MHS uh, by visiting us at masshist.org support. So thank you all and have a good evening. <laughs>